I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The new Rock Ridge School District and Essentia Health have entered into a unique partnership to provide student scholarships in areas of high need for Essentia. Will this be the year the Minnesota Legislature changes the so-called growler cap for small breweries? We'll have a report. And an impassioned speech this week at the Minnesota Legislature over permitting new mines in the state. These stories and voices of the region coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie is back after a couple of weeks away. And it looks like you got back just in time for spring. Timing is everything. I think it is. You had a good <laughs> vacation. I had a great vacation, but good to be back. All right, that's good. We'll begin now with the headlines. All right. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Denny. Longtime Minnesota State Senator Tom Bach announced Thursday he is not running for re-election. Bach is in his sixth term representing Senate District 3 in northern Minnesota and served four terms in the State House before that. With Senator David Tomasoni also leaving the Senate due to ALS, there will be a major change of Iron Range lawmakers in the fall election. A merger of the five northeastern Minnesota community colleges was approved by this week by the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities Board of Trustees. The new college will be called Minnesota North College with campuses in Ely, Eveleth, Grand Rapids, Hibbing, Virginia, and International Falls. The merger has been in the works for two years now and will allow students to take classes at any of the six campuses or online. A new Coast Guard cutter is heading for its home port of Duluth, just in time for the spring shipping season. The 225-foot buoy tender spar had been undergoing maintenance in Baltimore and is heading to the Twin Ports now. She will replace the Coast Guard cutter Alder, which was repositioned to the West Coast. And the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council announced the recipients of its annual Arrowhead Arts Awards this week. Keith Swanson won the George Morrison Artist Award as an individual whose body of work has made a significant contribution to the arts over time. Annie Dugan won the Maddie Simons Arts Advocate Award, and a new award for transformational art was given posthumously to Tweed Museum art curator Carissa White Isaacs. A unique partnership has been approved on the Iron Range that will help provide the next generation of health care providers. The new Rock Ridge School District accepted Essentia Health's 400 million dollar proposal, 400 thousand dollar proposal to provide education to employment student scholarships to areas of high need for Essentia. Here to tell us more is Dr. Noel Schmidt, the Rock Ridge School District Superintendent, and Tam Kreitzer is Essentia's Senior Vice President of Operations. And thanks to both of you for being here. Almost gave away a lot more money than you had planned, but, <laughs> but, but you love that. <laughs> we save you more money. <laughs> All right, I'm so used to uh, reading those large numbers in the news. Uh, anyway, Dr. Schmidt, maybe you could explain uh, a little bit about how this partnership between Rock Ridge School District and Essentia came together. This is what I would call a win-win opportunity mm -hmm. for our students and also for Essentia. Mm -hmm. We're in a very unique situation. We're designing a career academy. We're in the middle of building it. It will open in the fall of 2023. And so what we are doing is we are deliberately redesigning high school with spaces to give our students more opportunities to engage with local employers, the local business people in the area, so that our kids, when they leave high school, have a much better idea about in which direction they want to go, whether it be a four-year, two-year, one-year certification, and this includes the job area they want to go to. And so we are doing that and Essentia has stepped forward to help our kids and help our students because healthcare is a major driver of future jobs on the range. And so we know that many of our kids will be working in healthcare and we want our kids to have the advantage of working mm -hmm. with Essentia um, employees because we don't want students to make decisions on where they should go to college based on, well, what they think they like. We want them to know. And so we're designing career academies and Essentia is gonna work as a partner with us for our kids. Mm -hmm. And your goal, of course, is to have the benchmark standard of best in the world. 
How are you going to inspire students to do that so they can work at Essentia? Well, I think if we have an opportunity to engage with students and faculty to make them aware of what their future possibilities are, both at home and beyond the range, um, we'll have an opportunity to get them exposed to real world experiences up front. We're also gonna have the opportunity to work with teachers and give them things like externships so they can make classroom content pertinent and relevant to what real jobs are today. Mm -hmm. What are some of the real jobs right now that Essentia is maybe having a hard time filling and could really benefit from by having a program like this? You know, a lot of the tech positions mm -hmm. and healthcare are really an area of tremendous need for us right now. And most of the time, these are not four-year jobs. They are, in fact, 12-month or two-year training programs. So the opportunity to introduce real-time um, introduction to healthcare opportunities and then invest in students so that they know their training can be paid for and they have guaranteed jobs on the other end is something we're excited to provide. But things like rad techs, nurses aides are things that are in desperate need for us at, at um, many healthcare organizations right now. And so Dr. Schmidt, are teachers in your district going to be have taught how to reteach? It sounds like there's a, a lot for them to do. Uh, this is both the exciting part for our teachers and also what makes them nervous because yes, you are, we are going to have to teach differently. It isn't 1985, so our teachers will have to teach. The exciting p thing about this is we all know education is changing. Mm -hmm. This gives us an opportunity and our teachers have been great at this with the Career Academy. We know we want to put our teachers in front of professionals, people who are working in the business area, they're going to have to look at what is relevant for their students, the kids to know and learn. And in order to do that, our teachers will have to do teaching differently. For example, there'll be more project-based work, there'll be more hands-on work, and it actually is going to be a lot of fun and great things for our teachers and kids to enter into. Sounds that way. So. So Essentia is stepping forward to help out with the Health Science and Human Service Academy. Are you working with other uh, major industries or employers in the area to kind of get some of those other academies going? And if so, what might we expect to see in the future? We are working with all sorts of different industries mm -hmm. and companies up there. Uh, obviously, yes, we're working with the major mining companies on the range, but there are a lot of jobs and businesses in Ma and Pop and other agencies and so I'll give you an example of how this would play out we're building a high school so we have some storage sheds that were supposed to be built and so why don't we have the kids build them so our buildings and trades classes are building those buildings under the guidance of the construction workers who are up there and it's actually gone really really well and so the ocean inspector even came in and talked to our kids about Here's what you need to pay attention to if you were a real working person for a certain company. And they're done with one building and then they're going to keep on uh, cruising and our kids with the construction crew up there will be building yeah. uh, dugouts and some other facilities also. So Tam, what kind of jobs will then open at Essentia for these students down the line? Well, again, um, our industry will provide not only healthcare jobs, it's beyond doctors and nurses, which is what people frequently think about. Um, a, a lot of tech positions, rad techs, um, ultrasound techs, certified nurses aides, all of these will allow people to enter the healthcare industry and have a job, an opportunity to advance their career within, within Essentia if that's, the, if that's the path that they choose. But in collaboration with the Rock Ridge team, there are lots of other jobs. Um, we have IT jobs, we have jobs in finance, we have jobs, uh, we, we need chefs in, in terms of what we do. So we're gonna look for every opportunity to collaborate and provide as much exposure to the students of the Rock Ridge system as we possibly can. From a, an employer standpoint, does this represent a real paradigm shift in terms of how K through 12 prepares a future workforce? Well, you might be in a better position to answer that. I can answer it from a uh, I can answer it from an employer's perspective. What we know um, is is workforce is valuable, and we know we need to think differently about attracting a workforce and moving upstream to work collaboratively with educators. But I think you're in a better position to answer the first question. No, I it, it everything she said is true. 
we also want to be aware that our kids and students are going to be entering the workforce quickly and for a lot of our kids the one two year certification four year we want all those multiple pathways open so in working with Essentia we want our kids exposed sooner to that so mm -hmm. they're making better decisions when they leave our high school. Mm -hmm. So Tam how will you inspire students to uh, to reach that goal of best in the world? Best in the world, well that's where the collaboration with the teachers and the leaders of the Rockridge School District come together. Um, we will figure out how to create advisory boards, how to bring our professionals into the schools and collaborate with the teachers so that we can expose students to what the opportunities are. Um, we're hoping that we can get them into our facilities in a new way so that they can see it uh, in a first-hand uh, in, in a first-hand lens. So you expect this to be a long-term collaboration? We absolutely do. We have a long-term commitment uh, to the Iron Range, to the Arrowhead region, to every community that we serve. Dr. Schmidt is exactly right. This is a win-win opportunity for us and we're, we, we're thrilled to be excited about the vision that they're building at Rockridge. We mentioned in the headlines at the beginning about the area community colleges merging into the Minnesota North College. Mm -hmm. Are they at the table too? We have talked to them uh -huh. and we are hoping we can work some kind of arrangement out there because we think this, all of the organizations need to work together mm -hmm. to benefit our kids. That is the real goal that we want to do. So mm -hmm. yes, so stay tuned for further <laughs> details. Sounds exciting, all and, the best. And will the scholarships be available this year or will it wait until the, the new high school is completed? Um, we're hoping. We're ready. Uh -huh. We're ready, we're at the table, and we can't wait to get started. We have workforce needs immediately, so anything we can do to make opportunities available to students to reduce the cost of them entering the workforce is something that we're, we're going to lean into. All right. Well, thank you so much. Exciting things happening on the Iron Range. Appreciate your work. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Following passage of the Surly Taproom Law of 2011, Minnesota went from having about 20 craft breweries to over 100 today. But a state law that dates back to prohibition is hampering some of these breweries. Producer Megan McGarvey has a report on current legislation that could help free the growler. So there's over 9,000 breweries in the entire United States, and there are only five breweries in the entire United States who cannot sell some form of beer to go. And those five are in Minnesota. We found out about the growler cap in 2012 when Fulton and Liftbridge reached out to us and said, hey, we want to change this law because originally it was 3,500 barrels and we got it raised up to 20,000 barrels in 2013, I believe it was. And that's where we first heard about that. At that time, we were brewing 1,000 barrels in a year and that wasn't even anywhere near what we thought we were going to be doing. At that time in 2013, we did want, uh, we tried to get the growler cap raised to the 250,000 barrel level. So if you have a tap room, you can sell growlers to go. Thought, you know, just get it done and never have to revisit it again. And since then we've been trying to change it. Well, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about my legislation, House File 3183, which is a bill to eliminate what's known as the growler cap which is a restriction that prohibits breweries who brew more than 20,000 barrels of beer annually from selling their beer in 64 to-go containers known as growlers. Some people out there who think that passing this legislation would harm Minnesota's three-tier system, but the reality is the amount of beer that we're talking about here is literally drops in the barrel, drops in the bucket of the amount of beer that is flowing through Minnesota's three-tier system. We're talking about 1 20th of 1% of the beer that flows through Minnesota would be affected by this. So it would be a very small, very minimal impact on the three-tier system, but it will make a huge impact 
for the breweries that aren't able to sell growlers. So in Minnesota, the three-tiered system, this was something developed right after prohibition was done. And this separates, it separates all parties. You can't be, you can't be a producer, you can't be a, a, as well as a distributor, and you can't be a retailer, you know, a, on a big scale. I had some colleagues say, oh, well, if we pass this, can, can Coors come in and just start opening up tap rooms everywhere and selling growlers? No, there is a limit. With the growler cap and brewing licensing, there are actually two caps. So there's a cap on if you can or cannot sell growlers to go, and that's that 20,000 barrel cap that we are trying to raise to if you have a tap room, you can sell growlers to go. The other cap is an annual cap on how much beer you can sell in off sale to go. So there's already a built-in restriction that breweries cannot become competition with the liquor stores because we're already limited to the amount of beer we can sell to go in a year. And that is 750 barrels, which with our production is less than 1% of the beer that we produce. We're one of the most oppressive states for liquor laws in the country, and it's just, it's time for that to change. There are consumers out there that want the same thing that they can get in Wisconsin or Oregon or Colorado, and it's, it's time for Minnesota to catch up with that and give the consumers what they want while protecting all of the people within the system of liquor distribution and retail in the state. And, you know, Wisconsin, their growler cap is 300,000 barrels. Right in Minnesota, it's 20,000 barrels. So, you know, we want to keep Minnesota beer in Minnesota. We don't want to be losing on this jobs, this tax revenue, the economic development. And it, it, it's not only about the dollars, but it's about the sense of community pride that our craft breweries bring to our towns and our cities. I always equate it to the, the like the Irish pub. Every town in Ireland has a pub, and that's a community gathering right. place. And there's people doing gaming or knitting or having sing-alongs and we do that sort of thing here and all the taproom communities have that sort of community vibe and it ends up revitalizing small towns and big towns alike and different neighborhoods nodes so I just think it's an insanely great community catalyst to have these taprooms opening up. When we lost the ability to sell growlers in October of 19, uh, it was the, the previous day, September 30th, was one of our best days <laughs> and then the next day it was just done. But once you hit that threshold of your annual barrelage, we have to start thinking. And we may not, you know, ship as much beer on every truck and all of this stuff throughout the year in order to keep that as long as possible. So we have to play that game of, you know, when we lose it, that instantly gets rid of that 300,000. So how can we just not continue to grow past 20, which is just a really weird place for a business to have to strategize and think about. Why would we stifle that innovation by putting a limit on the breweries that can sell growlers? Growlers are a good way for these breweries to get their product out in the field, to see what consumers like, to see what they don't like. You know, why would we stifle that? Our business wouldn't change the second we hit 20,000 barrels We, uh, in terms of how many crawlers or growlers we sell. Nothing would change about our day-to-day -day business. We've attended St. Louis County um, Capital Days a couple of times, and both times has been about freeing the growler and educating. Uh, a, a difference this year was definitely that uh, people are more familiar with the issue. So it's not something new, and most reactions are like, yeah, we should just get that changed already. Uh, so people are familiar with, with the growler issue, and it's, um, you know, it's taken several years to try and try and get that change and get people more familiar with it. It's not just gonna change overnight. If you would like to learn more about this bill and future events surrounding this issue, go to supportmnbreweries.com. Also at the Minnesota Legislature this week, the Senate Mining and Forestry Policy Committee heard testimony on a measure that would improve the mining permitting process. During that hearing, Senator Tom Bach of Cook gave an impassioned speech in support of the bill. This kind of development is critically important to our country's future, to my grandkids' uh, future, and why we can't mine it here you know, when we've been doing it for 142 years and still have the cleanest water and the cleanest air in the state, I, I, I think it's very hypocritical for people to be against mining and then use all the benefits of it every day. 
all the people against it, they're going to go home tonight and they're going to turn on their hot water faucet or their cold water faucet and all that water is going to run through copper pipes. They're going to flip on the light switch and that electricity is going to run through copper wire. Oh, but boy, we can't mine copper. Where do you think it's going to come from? As this world industrializes, the demand for these kind of metals is only going to increase. And we'll recycle everything we can recycle. But as mines get mined out, new mines have to be developed. The bill passed on a four to two vote of the committee and we'll move on to the Energy and Natural Resources Policy Committee next. Next, it's time for Voices of the Region. Each week, we talk with an area journalist about the stories they are covering. Our guest today is Danielle Kading with Wisconsin Public Radio. The Superior City Council approved awarding a contract to Magellan Advisors for its Connect Superior project. That project seeks to build a municipal-owned fiber optic network, and the goal is to increase competition among providers and to lower the cost of high-speed internet access and significantly boost speeds and reliability. Um, the contract that was awarded to Magellan, which is based in Denver, is for conducting the design and also developing business and grant plans for the project. And that's just the first step in planning the broadband network um, it would include looking at costs to build the network, uh, where fiber cables would be installed, and any construction challenges that might arise. And Council President Tyler Elm said the company has worked with more than 400 local governments, um, connecting more than 1 million homes across the country. And uh, he and the city's mayor recently visited a community that Magellan is working with in Oregon, where a build out is currently underway. And so Design and planning will move forward on that project, and that will be funded by money the city received through the American Rescue Plan, and the cost of that work is expected to run under a half million dollars. Superior officials, including Mayor Jim Payne, are trying to get the word out that people won't be able to use ballot drop boxes for the upcoming election on April 5th. And that all stems from a lawsuit that was brought by the conservative group, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. Um, they sued the Wisconsin Elections Commission over guidance that were issued on the use of ballot drop boxes. And a Waukesha County judge sided with conservatives saying they weren't allowed. And that decision was later overturned on an appeal for the February election because a panel of judges ruled there was some potential for voter confusion and votes may have been cast through these boxes already. And so the Wisconsin Supreme Court kept that decision in place for the February election when they heard the case, but they decided they should go, um, they, they shouldn't be used for next month's election. At this week's Superior School Board meeting, the Superior School District Administrator, Amy Starzecki, said the district has now joined schools across Wisconsin that are using the Speak Up, Speak Out app. And this app was launched in the fall of 2020 by the Wisconsin Department of Justice as basically a one-stop shop for reporting safety concerns. Um, the app provides 24-7 support for any reports of threats, whether it's an active shooter, or reports of students threatening to harm themselves. And those reports can be made anonymously. And it's basically an additional safety tool to prevent school violence. And Starzecki said that she and other staff have gone through training on the app. Um, those reports will go to designated staff within the district. And the app is also now on the school's website. And the district spent basically the last month working with counselors and principals to roll out um, the Speak Up, Speak Out app with a presentation to students and parents were notified. And Starzecki said that students have already begun using it. And in the first year of its use statewide, state justice officials said they received more than 1,500 contacts 
through the app, and it's used by a vast majority of schools across the state. The commission met late last week and heard presentations from the Duluth Firm's Creative Arcade and Swim Creative, along with Travel Superior, which has done marketing for the city in the past. But as you may recall, the Superior City Council voted last year to create this commission and allocate 70% of room tax revenues that are collected by the city uh, to the commission. And so that money was previously going to Travel Superior, which used it to fund organizations like the Richard I. Bong Veterans Historical Center and things like advertising. And so now the commission has recommended contracting with Duluth Swim Creative to handle marketing or advertising in the city moving forward. Um, and the Superior Telegram reported that a, a contract still has to be put together and approved by the commission. That's our time for now, but you can keep up with our latest updates by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter, or visit the WDSE website for program updates and more information about the station. And download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of Almanac North and your favorite PBS programs. And Julie, I'm looking forward to the spring thaw as this continues. It might be a good weekend to shed the winter coat and get outside. I like that idea. Thanks <laughs> to our guests and the crew in the studio. With Julie Zenner, I'm Dennis Anderson. Good night, everybody, and be kind.